Hello, welcome back to the IVF Daddies podcast. Hello, I'm Richard Westerby. And I'm Holly Vatja. Today we're going to be talking about something that uh, is quite relevant to our podcast because, as you will know by now, I am an IVF daddy and I have twins, Zander and Lulu, with my ex husband. So, a lot of you are asking, how did IVF daddies come about? And I think we've touched on that briefly before, but I think a lot of the inspiration came um, after I met Don Julio Gadja. So we separated and then I decided that I wanted to fulfill a dream of mine, which was to take my children to Spain to get them to go to school in Spain. Because I grew up between Spain and England. My mother's South American. From where? From Chile. Okay. And um, your dad? My dad's English. And you were born? In England. Okay. Um, what did you do? Where in Spain did you live? So in the early 80s, my parents moved to Marbella in the south of Spain. And so I've grown up speaking Spanish and English. And my children don't speak Spanish, which is... Well, but I see that you speak to them in Spanish and they understand when you speak to them. And when they want something, they will say, they will ask in Spanish. When they want something, exactly. If already dating is difficult and dating in the gay world is difficult as a gay man with kids, did you, did you put those things in perspective? You don't get married to think that you're going to end up getting divorced, right? You get married forever. Um, but as I alluded to, you know, I changed. Having a child as a gay couple wasn't easy. It wasn't like you just rolled over and one day I was pregnant. Um, so there was a lot of process a lot of emotion a lot of time energy and money that went into that so i don't think in our instance the children drove us apart and they didn't bring us together they they were a glue that kept us together for the time that we were together and i think um it got to the point when i was like okay well i don't think you know this isn't working but getting out of a long relationship already makes you feel like you're lost in the dating world so as a the older we get the less chances we think we have or yeah. whatever and then you have also kids not one but two twins boy and a girl how does it how did, what was going through your mind it was really hard um it was something i put to the back of my mind i was like no children are going to come first that's just you know you don't even think about dating don't even think about relationships don't even think about any of that. It's interesting that we all have that thought, even though we both come from remarried parents. Mm. It that is, had yeah. kids. That had children, exactly. Yeah. But I, I, again, I think every relationship is different. Every breakup is different. There was no third party involved in my separation. So for us, it was just we grew apart and, and we wanted different things in life. So... I think for me, and I, it was very much a, I'm just going to focus on the children. I'm not going to focus on dating. I mean, I know a divorce doesn't mean anything. If anything, my younger sisters are the best thing ever happened to me. And that comes out of the, the second marriage of my dad. And uh, there is, is life after everything. But when you go through IVF, you it's such a long process. And so a process was just touched not easy access of information that is almost like you're swimming so hard across the Atlantic to get to the sand and to just drop everything else. Like what advice would you give to people that have kids through IVF and they are about to get divorced thinking if life is going to happen after what's going to happen? For gay dads, my children are now 11. So 12 years ago, it was very much people weren't doing this. So we were, proving a point in inverted commas, we became very heteronormative, you became very married couple with children, da, da, da. What you don't want to do is those people who said, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, it's never going to last, da, da, da. You don't want them to be right. So you're always going to fight against that. You're going to fight for the relationship as much as you can. So my advice to anybody is do what's right for you. Don't worry about what other people think. And I do worry a lot about what other people think. And so for me, it was very difficult to get to the point of, okay, this isn't working and what are we going to do about it? And that conversation took a long time to 
happen. And when you are divorced, when you're already separated and you're going through the divorce and are you, what does it, what was going to your mind when meeting someone else and were you looking for, were you like shut down to the possibility or? I wasn't looking for anybody else. And I think that's maybe why when it happened, it was like, oh, hello. I've always said that when you're not looking is when be, like, because yeah. if you're looking, you kind of project aspiration. And when you're not looking, you are focused in some other things and that gives relevancy to people. But what is that with that? Like, I just want to know, I, I'm curious to know if does the kids through IVF had a weight on the thought or it had nothing to do with IVF? It, that part was hard. Getting to the point of separating was hard. But then once it's done, it's done. It's not. It, it's irrelevant where how the children arrived or if they were adopted or surrogacy or co- however. It, it doesn't matter. What would you say is the percentages of single people through IVF than couples through IVF? Well, I think single people is a lot fewer. Probably about 10 to 15 percent of the people I help are single. But interestingly, what I have seen is that there are lots of people who have children and then separate at any stage of the child's life um as if the kid is going to fix the marriage and then it doesn't no no not necessarily i mean there are there are people that have a child to fix a marriage and i'm talking about the people who you know when you have a child your priorities change in life yeah and my priorities very much became my children to the detriment of everything else. And I think that um, a lot of people do that and they forget who they are. They forget who their relationship are. They forget to put the time, the effort, the energy, the emphasis on the relationship. And it's all about the children and the children and the children. And I think that's a big takeaway that I would say to anybody is really focus on yourself. Make sure that you are happy because if you're not happy, your children are never going to be happy. Yeah, I believe that if your jar of water is empty, you have no water to pour to Correct. anyone that needs it. Yep. That gives me, like, what I'm taking from you is it doesn't really affect. So mm-hmm. if you have kids with, through IVF or not, the relationship is a, one entity and then parenting yeah. is another entity and then the kids are another entity. Correct. I don't think the IVF... I mean, IVF, if you are... Remember, I'm a gay, we were a gay couple. We didn't have struggles to get to having the baby. I think there are lots of heterosexual couples where it becomes all consuming. All they think about is baby, 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 baby. And that can take a toll on the relationship. And then the flip side of that is you spend so long trying to get pregnant. You get pregnant, you have a baby, and you think it's all going to be happy, hunky dory. And babies cry. They don't sleep. You don't sleep. Everything becomes about the baby. And it's not the reality that you thought it was going to be. And that also can be a struggle. So I think my my view on this is very different to maybe a, a straight person's view on this. But for me, it, it, the IVF was irrelevant to, to my separation and divorce. Well, I mean, I think the virtue that the United States has is the IVF is a privilege for gay people. You can go there, have your kids be protected. Um, and uh, the IVF for heterosexual people, let, I think, started to be an option. But most stories is a measure of desperation. And when I can only imagine, like, I'm not a woman and I would love to hear the, I would love to hear comments and I would love to have, we all have stories that we're going to put on the podcast. But I would love to hear if any of you have a story to share. But I can only imagine if you cannot get to terms to carry a baby and you feel like you're failing at uh, your reproductive system and then you're forcing to take hormones, medication, uh, and if the baby doesn't stick to your uh, Uterus. uterus and then you have to go to a surrogate, all of that can take a toll mentally on you and the couple. For, for a gay couple, we didn't have any of that. But for straight people, that is huge. And it can be destroying. Yeah. I um, hope we can make the, change that to make the silver lining and 
the ability to have the option. And that's exactly why we're doing this podcast is there. I talk to many, many people who it sounds weird, but they, they start talking to me and they're, they're very much broken. And then they leave our conversation with a glimmer of hope. And then all of a sudden, you know, two years later, it's not all of a sudden, but two years later, I'm getting a text message with a photograph of a baby. And I think that, that, that a lot of that, how people are broken is because they don't know what their options are and they don't know what can be done. And it, and they have to almost grieve for the baby they never had and then embrace the baby they're going to have. And that's really important. And I think one of the things that I've learned through my separation is just be kind to yourself because we put so much pressure on ourselves to do the right thing, be the right person, say the right things. And actually that in itself can be destroying. You need to be, you need to look in the mirror every day and go, you are amazing. Yeah. Because we do it to everybody else. We do it to our work colleagues. We, you know, we'll praise people when they're doing a good job, but you don't do it to yourself. So I I always say, just be kind to yourself. I mean, life is hard enough. Just, yeah. the thought process that went through my head since the day I met you to today. So does your kids feel weird being kids through IVF surrogacy with gay parents or? Well, we, we've empowered them from the day they were born to know their story. I'm a firm believer in honesty throughout my life. And I think the children know egg donation so they hear me talking about this every day they probably they aced their biology tests because they get it right they understand this whole process so they i always wanted them to be empowered in case anybody came against them about anything to be children of gay dads you don't know who your mother is like all those different things to be able to have an answer to be able to just shut it down have that ever happened have yep. you have you yeah yep it's happened at school it's happened with um, my children being excluded from a play date because the parents disagreed with, in inverted commas, their dad's lifestyle. That's happened. Um, it's your mother's dead. Um, the you, uh, your mother must not have wanted you. So that's why you have two dads. Yeah, it's, it's all of that's happened. But they. How do they respond to that? I think they were able to say, well, actually, I have two dads and a tummy mummy, which is who our surrogate we used to call her a tummy mummy. I have two dads and a tummy mummy. I have three people who love me to get me here. So I don't know what you're talking about. To just shut it down. Um, but, you know, they come home and it hurts. They were upset and crying and like, yeah, that's heartbreaking. As a parent, it's heartbreaking because that doesn't come from the children. That comes from the parents. Yeah. And I remember once going to the school and saying to the school, this is going on. And the headmaster said, well, your children need to learn how to deal with it. They're going to have to, they'll have this throughout their life. They're going to have to deal with it. To me, that was the wrong reply. I mean, it's wrong reply, but such a hard truth. But would he have said the same had, my ch- had I a child of color? And somebody had been racist. Yeah, no, because then there will be no effect on him. Right. So to me, that was the wrong reply. Yeah. If it happens on school campus, it's... the school needs to step in. But, but there is a reality. This is going to happen to them throughout their lives. And again, I want them to have an armor. I need them to have the armor to be able to say, oh, just go away. I mean, the thing is, uh, 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 what you're saying is actually made me rephrase what I just said because if you go and say my kid is deadly allergic to peanuts and there's peanuts in your school he's not going to say to you he has to learn how to deal with that right yeah I couldn't agree more and yet here we are my kids have to deal with it wow but they can deal with it and they they can they're ferocious they're amazing they're amazing and they're because they're loved and they, they I think that one of the things that um, I went to see a therapist throughout the divorce separation. And, and she was very much adamant, and to this I will always be thankful, to just reiterate and reiterate to the children that this wasn't their fault, that they had nothing to do with this, they are loved, 
no matter what they do, they are loved. Um, and, and that, that's really powerful to be able to have a child who knows that life happens, things happen. Yeah. I think anything, any, like, in my opinion, the difference between adversity and trauma is when you go through adversity and you have someone to fall back on, to be there, to give you support and to tell you, keep going and to arm you and, and have your back is what prevents you from trauma, which is going through adversity and not having anyone to be there for you to help. It's like a scar. It's like if you treat it properly, it heals. And if it doesn't, it just gets infected. Yep. So I think your kids are amazing. And I think you are an amazing father. And I Thank love you. the family that you guys are. And as I've said, I love you for you. I love your kids for your kids because they're amazing kids. I mean, they, don't, they legit are amazing kids because <laughs> you could tolerate someone's kids when you're dating them and, marry, and marrying them. And I'm very lucky. And I love the you with your kids. But what were you thinking? This is a, actually a great question. It's like, so we met, obviously we became friends and, and what, what we didn't talk about was the fact that, so um, you have a niece and nephew in Madrid as there was lots of things that you could do for children. So you met the children very, very early, early on into our friendship. Well, I think our bond was that because Madrid is such a, so long story short, uh, you took your kids to Madrid to learn Spanish and uh, Madrid is not a, a kid-friendly city. Uh, we're in London now, and London is kids everywhere. Like, you go to the gym, and then you see parents with their kids, uh, the locker room changing, uh, the, uh, the classes at the gym for kids, everything. Everywhere there's a kid-friendly. In Madrid, is like, not very much. So things to do with kids is very difficult to find. And I have my niece and nephews that now are around the same age as your kids, I think that's the reason that we bonded it because it was, I already knew where to go because I was either going to with my niece and nephews or have been with my niece and nephews. So I was like, oh, let's, I'll go with you to this museum. I'll take, I took my niece and nephews to VR and I'm like a kid on the inside. So, so you were basically using my children to do stuff you wanted to oh, do. I still, <laughs> I tell them until today, I still tell them today, like, I'm going to use you to go to like arcade games and VR and w watch the new Aquaman movie in two days and all of that. But the fact that I feel, I felt like you felt relieved to have a friend that can find things to do for the kids for you in a new city. I wasn't looking to date anybody and let alone with kids. So for me, it was like, you made me well, realize like a rom-com you gave up your job in the city you moved back to the town to yeah. save the local bakery yeah but <laughs> it, it, it's just like i've always loved the idea of having a family and seeing you made me realize how much i want what you had i believe the way you conditioned your kids are going to grow to that but they go to school they come back they do their homework like we never talk about struggling because they come from gay parents or... No. Well, because friends. to them, it's their norm. That's yeah. their life, right? They, they've they grown up. They grew up with two dads. They are... They're just children living their life. And I think, again, this comes back to empowering them from when they were little. But also, so we were meant to be in Madrid for three to six months. And we we were there for about seven weeks because the school they were in, they didn't enjoy. They weren't enjoying the entire situation that we were in and they wanted to come back to London and I always said to them I was like the day that you are done the day that you sit there and say we don't want to do this anymore we will go because I do believe in the fact that you can make mistakes in life and move on you can say this isn't working and we can change and and, and I think teaching them the ability to go back to your adversity versus trauma we have a fallback. We can leave. Also, you job didn't move you to Spain, so you had to force them to adapt. So you were doing it for them. Right, because I work from home. I can work from anywhere. I was doing this for them as an experience. But it's what's amazing is they've taken from it, they've learned from it something I'm really, really happy about, which is resilience. 
And I saw this when we came back. They 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 didn't enjoy it. They came back, and two days later, they were back in their school having a great time. But the other thing they've learned is empathy, because we came back, and then the Russian-Ukrainian war started, and there were a number of Ukrainian children that joined the school that they're in, not speaking English, not having any friends, not knowing the system. And I saw my two children embracing those children, helping them just helping them to adapt and to be and to thrive. Being there for them because they knew what it felt like. They knew what it felt like to be the outsider. And I think that that is a lesson that, and it was an, a lesson I didn't think that they were going to learn. Um, I hope they would learn Spanish. They didn't learn Spanish, but they learned empathy. They learned a <laughs> l- better weapon than Spanish, trust me. Correct. So, yeah, I, I mean, I've always said it. When you never leave your hometown and when you live outside, you learn to expand your, your ability to suffer or enjoy multiple things. And it makes you um, stronger, resilient and... and you don't really, I don't really want people to go through what I went through. Right. So I almost believe that you can have cognitive empathy, but you can not really fake it. You can, I could never speak with someone that I have never gone through the same process. So the more experience you do, the better. Okay. So the other question that had nothing to do with kids, but remember when we were watching Paris in Love uh, and she's doing, she kept doing IVF. Yes. So she had her boy, uh, Phoenix. Phoenix. <laughs> oh my God, I got you hooked. <laughs> um, so Perry says uh, Phoenix. Uh, and then she kept doing IVF and she says something along the line says, I am looking for the girl and I have a football team of men. How does she know with IVF alone if it's a man or a woman? So what she was doing wasn't only IVF. It was a, it was a process called embryo banking. So she was doing injections to have the doctor take out as eggs. So she probably did, I think she did three or four cycles. The IVF is when they put the sperm into the egg. So she was doing embryo banking. So they took out the eggs. They did the IVF part of it because IVF is taking out the eggs, making the embryos and putting them back in. But she didn't do them putting them back in. So she was trying to get a girl. So they were making the embryos and then they can do a, biopsy on those embryos to look inside the cells to see the sex so can you like can you put like a sperm in the embryo be a male embryo remove the sperm put another sperm to, no 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 so be- when they happen they you either freeze them or cancel it so what happens is each cell in your body has two chromosomes so an egg has two the sperm has two but what happens is to make an embryo, one chromosome from the sperm and one chromosome from the egg join. Oh, so it's not like you can see the sperm if it's going to create a woman or a man or the egg if it's... No, exactly, which is why it's always the men that create the sex. So XX is a girl, XY is a boy. So it's either the X or the Y on the sperm that's going to make the boy or the girl. So what they were doing was they were doing that and then they were creating embryos and testing them to see what sex they were. So he was providing males. He was the one that kept providing the Y chromosome, which meant they kept getting boys until they got girls. So she was, which is London. So they were doing embryo banking and then they had a surrogate. So then they would do the second part of the IVF, which is they then took that embryo and put it into the surrogate. Then my other question is, how did she manage to keep it so private? Even her fa- like, don't you have an emergency contact? You do, absolutely. Um, but that's called legal contracts. It's confidential. It literally says in there, you are not allowed to discuss this with anybody. So if they didn't want to talk about it, they didn't talk about it. And they didn't. And that's amazing. Wow. So... Uh, Okay, so that's so when you go through IVF, because I, I've just realized. I mean, this is, of course, with the visibility that I can find. Uh, I, if there's any more stories out there, we would love to know and hear, and and shine a light on it, so you can find community and people say I'm not alone. But I've seen 
from The Real Housewives of New York how uh, Jessa says that she had two kids for IVF, she's from India, and then she said, I want to go for a third kid. Now that she's on TV, she has to bring it to her mother. So it's this aspect of n not only uh, gay parents, but religious, color, races, um, the watching on Married to Medicine, uh, see Dr. Jackie talking about the fertility death rates on uh, black women uh, is higher than white women. And that to me is, is, is something that I want to talk about it as much as we can. Yeah, but that, that comes into the taboo around IVF and assisted reproduction, which is what IVF basically is. But I think, you know, I always say that it doesn't matter who you are. If you need help, we're going to give you help. So I've helped many, many people from all walks of life. But to the confidentiality part, it's nobody's business. It's their business. And unless they want to talk about yeah. it, which obviously if you're on The Real Housewives of New York and you're doing a whole episode on IVF, it's going to get out there. So if she weren't on that show, would she have told her mother? Probably not no. because of that taboo. But what what I would love to be able to do with all of this, which is what we are doing, is we're shining that light that it doesn't matter who you are. This is not a bad thing. Yeah. Asking for help, no matter where you are, is not a bad thing. Yeah. And also because I, I was talking to one of my younger sisters about the egg freezing. They're around 25, 27. Um, and she was saying to me that because of the podcast in season one, she was re-questioning her fertility because they're very successful. They're working, they're in the field of corporate and they're starting to grow in their career yet being shamed or making them feel guilty that they're not becoming moms. So she said to me, I'm just surprised that nobody brought up and the, all this time that I've gone through the doctor or gynecologist, uh, my fertility, my eggs, the only story that I know apart from the podcast is one friend that had to do it for desperate measures. Right. There shouldn't be desperate measures. This should be the same as going to do your annual checkup. You know. do your fertility checkup. What? Well, it's a blood test and an, and a vaginal ultrasound on a woman and a sperm test for a guy. I keep seeing and hearing on IVF from Chloe Kardashian to uh, any other woman that is considering having kids. When women say, I don't know, like the surrogacy, like it was gonna feel weird if I don't carry my baby, is it gonna feel like my baby? Not one single man have ever questioned if it's gonna feel weird to being a dad well but again i think that's societal men grow up knowing they're not going to carry a baby whereas a woman does they know they go to school they know they hear about pregnancy they do all those different things so i think for men and women it's very different women have that inherent belief that that's what they're going to do whereas men are like it's just going to appear when you say that and then i hear you saying that when you were with your surrogate you guys were pregnant so it feels like it, it contradicts it shuts that down mm -hmm. because if like i don't think you did you ever feel like you were completely detached from the kids until they touch your skin pretty much i didn't it didn't feel like i, well, I remember my surrogate was in phoenix i was in london it was a long way away I, i'm tied to paris hilton um she was a long way away and so for me it was an ethereal concept it was we're pregnant in as much as that's what I felt, but at the same time, I didn't feel that. So it's not like you were controlling, calling her every day. You wanted to move to your house and you wanted to cook the right food for her. Well, of course, I mean, this, this was my first pregnancy, so I didn't know what to expect. So I wanted to know. I wanted to ask questions. I wanted to know what was going on. And I remember that the OBGYN, who was a friend of ours, was like, just, she's done this before. Relax. She's fine. It's okay. But I was like, okay, well, I want to know more. So it was a very fine line. So we had calls every two weeks. And then as, as the pregnancy progressed, that came down to every week. 
but yeah, I mean, it was, I wanted to, are you eating organic? Are you walking to work? I, working out? And she's like, I so you are, so you, so you feel like she was having something that is yours. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, wait, did my Amazon package arrive? Not quite like that. No. So you do like, you like. No returns available. So when did it hit to like, oh, wow, I am a dad. When they were born, I guess. Did you cry? I cry at everything. I cry at everything. I mean, did I cry? Of course, I bawled my eyes out. Um, B-A-W-L-E-D, guys. Um, yeah, I cried. Wait, balls, ball my eyes out? It's not ball, like the ball, like the eye will no, fall out? No, B-A-W-L-E-D is to ball. What? Yeah. That's a first. I thought balling my eyes out means that you cry so much that the eyeball falls out. <laughs> Okay. If you guys have any questions or comments on, do you feel if it's weird having someone else to carry your baby? Or if you've ever had a surrogate and you want to share your experience on when did you feel a parent, it will be amazing if you can comment or send us a message. Okay. So if I do a last question and I can ask you, what, what's the aim of all of this? Why are you, you have two kids, you have a job. Uh, why are you making time for this? I want to do a few things in my life. And one of them is empower people to make the right decision, especially around their IVF choices, because I felt that I didn't have that. And I think knowledge is power and information just helps you get to where you need to be. That's one thing. Two, I find this incredibly fulfilling, helping people with a dream. I mean, not many people can say that their job is fulfilling dreams. I mean, probably Santa Claus is one of them. Um, but I love what I do and it's, it's a phenomenal thing. And then the third thing is I want other people to experience what I've had. This is the best thing I've ever done. Why are you doing this? Well, the reason I'm doing this is because nothing makes a better family or a better kid than someone that really is sure that they want them. There's a lot of things that I see that are not fair and the level of injustice, uh, especially living in Spain, uh, coming from Latin America. Not everybody has the privilege to go to the United States to do the surrogacy process. It's a very expensive process and there are a lot of laws trying to block that. And I also want to make egg freezing the new Botox, something that every girl gets a certain age because it's, it's normal. Like, you know, it's like it's part of your life to have it. It's, I want grandparents to say, like, I give you as a graduation present freezing your eggs so you can have your career and you can have your life. I want people to be able to start the process not having to travel countries to go to the first seminar. I feel like everybody deserves a family and everybody deserves every family is different and the more that we can find one person saying oh that story sounds like mine i'm not alone that's just if i can just help one person do a link to their joyful process of creating a family i already went it's beautiful yeah and on that note we're going to leave you thank you for listening please don't forget to like subscribe listen, share, anything at IVF Daddies is the podcast handle. Um, if you can follow the channel, the better, the more followers, the bigger the guests that we can have and the more resources we can get to the bottom of every question and stay tuned for more. Thank you for listening.